what did this magnitude 7 earthquake in Alaska with an epicenter under the Hubbard Glacier do? We know it's a fault system there, the Fairweather Fault, but it's way more complex than we thought because it's right underneath this glacier ice sheet, which can have totally other implications that you, I bet you, would not have thought about. And guys, we have a chance, a 6% chance right now, that there could be a triggered event of magnitude 7 or even larger in the same area. I'm going to explain to you why. What is shaking Alaska, guys? A quick update about the magnitude 7 quake that we have just experienced in Alaska. Over the past week, they were, and the Alaska Earthquake Center just reported this, over 1,500 earthquakes, seismic events, and two thirds of which are aftershocks of the largest event this week, the magnitude 7.0, that was December 6th, Hubbard Glacier Earthquake, how they call it. And this event had an epicenter 60 miles north of Yakutat. I've shown you in my last image about this. If you want to see a longer image of what really happened there and what all the fault lines are doing, um, click the video in the end screen. I'll put it there. And this event was reported as felt by Alaskans and Canadians throughout the region. The main shock was followed by two magnitude 5 earthquakes within the first 10 minutes. And of course, they gave a tsunami warning and the energetic aftershock sequence has since produced almost 300 events above magnitude 3. So it's a storm of aftershocks that we're seeing there. And this Saturday Hubbard Glacier earthquake has ruptured a northern strand of the Fairweather Fault system that is basically part of the Greater Queen Charlotte Fault. It's a strike slip system. They call it sometimes San Andreas Fault of the North. This strike slip system basically accommodates um, built up strain as the Pacific Plate and the North American Plates are grinding past one another. So this is not a subduction system. It's basically like cars passing each other in the opposite direction. And yes, over the last century, the Fairweather Fault System has produced five earthquakes greater than magnitude seven along the Panhandle. That was including the devastating 1958 magnitude 7.8 Elfin Cove earthquake that led to this Latuya Bay landslide and tsunami. This was not a tsunami that was going massively all over the Pacific Ocean, like something that we've seen at the Tohoku Japan earthquake in 2011. This was more localized and it was not directly caused by the earthquake because the earthquake caused a mountain collapse in a narrow fjord and that massive chunk of rock was collapsing into the water and then this bathtub effect in this narrow fjord was causing this massive massive tsunami but the scars are still visible today and everyone is of course afraid that something like this might happen again and it just I just reported about another landslide that basically happened there somewhat unnoticed. And we have several areas that are under threat that mountain collapse and landslides might come down. And of course, if such a big earthquake happens, it shakes and rattles everything. And whatever is unstable at that moment, boof, it can come and it can crash down. The shaking near the epicenter of that earthquake likely reached intensity seven. That is very, very strong. And direct impacts on humans were limited. This is because the earthquake occurred below extensive remote nature preserves on the US side, um, the Wrangell Street Elias National Park and on the Canadian side, the Kluane National Park. So these aren't your typical national parks that are packed with RVs moving. It's generally on the Canadian side only accessible by plane basically. But there was something close to the earthquake, and that's a vast glacier. The earthquake occurred di directly beneath the beautifully named Mount Hubbard, and then across the border to the south, progressively grinding its way towards its terminus in the more ominously named Disenchantment Bay. So both two interesting names. 
So this earthquake occurred in an area of very complex crustal faulting driven by a major change in the shape of a tectonic plate boundary at its northeasternmost corner. The Pacific plate is moving about 5.5 centimeters towards the north-northwest compared to the North American plate. And along the Canadian coast to the south, this motion largely is taken up by stripe slip faulting along the Queen Charlotte Fairweather fault system. I have told you a lot about this in my last video about this quake. So the Hubbard Glacier earthquake occurred between several mapped fault systems in this complex region. So the epicenter lies very close to the more than, northernmost tip of this Fairweather fault. That fault lines up nicely with another strike slip fault on the northern side of the glacier. It's called the Totschunda fault, which connects into the Denali fault, which is also a problematic fault. So the specific geometry of the faults in between is not really super well known. It's likely because of the immense fields of glacial ice that is sitting on top of the rocks. So also a lack of previous large earthquakes and perhaps the international border contributes to that. And that's why if you look at that map, you see a question mark there. There's a gap between the Fairweather Fault and the Totunda Fault because they don't know anything about that. The aftershock distribution that we're seeing here follows the course of the upper Hubbard Glacier. That indicates that the rupture likely lies beneath the ice along its edge, hidden underneath the ice. The aftershocks form more of a cloud than a line. So we can't see an obvious linear, linear feature that would be like a candidate fault plane or something like this. The question might arise, what happens when a large earthquake occurs directly beneath a glacier? Is that, does that have any effect on a glacier run or a lahar landslide? One of the most prominent examples of this is from the 2002 Denali earthquake, which crossed about 99 kilometers, roughly 70 miles of glacial ice. There was rupture of the underlying crust in that case, and that has produced some remarkable fracturing of the overlying ice that you can see here. So now we have this new earthquake at a glacier. So it's a great opportunity for scientists to go out there and uh, look for rock ice deformation patterns or features. We know that glaciers move continuously, right? So it will be important to capture the deformation across the ice fields as quickly as possible. Because when they studied the Denali earthquake, they found measurements of offsets when the fault trace was crossing the glaciers, which then they had to correct using bedrock measurements on the other side because the glacier is moving. But what the scientists say, we can also expect that this intense shaking might have destabilized some parts of the glacier that could cause avalanches, faster sliding of the ice and or iceberg calving at the terminus. Studies have shown guys that glaciers can be sensitive to even extremely far off seismic shaking. We had the 2010, it was a magnitude 8.8, .8, the Maule earthquake in Chile, that has caused the so-called ice quakes in Antarctica. So that raises the question, could some of the aftershocks that we're seeing right now actually be caused by ice movement? Ice quakes are also known as cryoseisms. We recently talked about cryovolcanoes because scientists have the theory that interstellar object 3 Atlas is actually a cryovolcano erupting ice. It's interesting. So we know that cryoseisms like ice earthquakes have been known to reach magnitudes of magnitude 5 or larger. So if that is happening right now, it might explain why the aftershocks seem to follow the glacial valley. And that certainly would complicate the discussion about where is the fault location. 
But the interaction between earthquakes and glaciers also go in the opposite direction. The weight of the ice of the glacier like pushes down the underlying crust. So that's a slow process that might, might last thousands of years. But when the ice then melts, the crust slowly rebounds. This process, for example, is responsible for many of the earthquakes that are detected in Eastern North America, far away from any tectonic plate boundaries, right? That would explain it. And today, in our times, we have glaciers retreating. So we're seeing a new set of earthquakes in addition to those that are caused by long-term ice sheet retreat. In Greenland, for example, it looks like ice melting seems to be causing more shallow earthquake scenarios, low magnitude earthquakes, in addition to the deeper, um, moderate sized events that are associated with post-glacial rebound. So actually, this Hubbard Glacier earthquake might turn out to be a new opportunity for earthquake geologists and ice scientists to work together to understand the physics of this coupled ground ice system. But these glaciers come with hazards, right? So scientists have to be very, very careful. And since we're still expecting more aftershocks, if they want to collect data on the ground or on the ice, they have to be very, very careful. The USGS aftershock forecast currently indicates that we should expect about six magnitude five plus earthquakes in this area over the coming year with a 6% chance of a triggered event of magnitude 7 or larger. So the charts that I have shown you hopefully gave you a little bit of an update and I will continue to update you. I have two more videos coming out today that are space breaking, mind breaking guys. So wait for that. Please subscribe. And I hope to see you in the next one. If you want to support the channel with coffee, link is in the description. Thanks so much for watching guys. Click here. I see you in the next one.